Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship for our service today. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them, please, to uh, Psalm chapter 139. I want to share a passage of Scripture with you and then give you some thoughts. I've been toying with the title of this sermon today, but I uh, haven't really got a formal title for it yet. I'll get something here before we put it out online. But right now I've got something like... How to bring out love in my mate when my mate is trying to hate me. That's an interesting title. <laughs> For some of you listening who are incredibly joyously married and maybe you know been listening to our our services on the, the love languages and stuff, and maybe at least for the last couple of months you've been incredibly joyously married uh, this uh, sermon today hopefully will help you be able to keep that love going a little bit longer for some of you looking to get married um, you better start taking notes right now and d'artagnan i was surprised i was actually thinking that he might want to get up and go around and, and take some notes because you know he's nine years old now and he is very anxiously looking forward to getting married with a little girl named kendra and guess what i said that online so now the whole world's gonna know and and maybe you should take some notes and try to figure out some of these things now before you get to the ripe old age of 10. Uh, for those singles today who want to get married, um, it'd be good for you to take some notes. Uh, Psalm chapter 139. I'm actually uh, this is uh, this lesson is probably one of the ones that I'm going to be including in a in a series of uh, marriage counseling tapes. We'll see how how it goes today if we might want to include this one or not. Psalm chapter 130 uh, chapter 139. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 17. Psalm chapter 190, 139, beginning in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Now, this passage is one of those passages in the scriptures that uh, we use to, uh, you know, in our, in our um, when we deal with people who are pro-choice and are in favor of abortion. Verses 15 through 16 in there specifically talk about that. It says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. This is talking about from the very conception when, when it was made. And he says, I curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That word wrought means that when it was fashioned, when it was made, and when that baby was wrought, when their baby was formed. And he says that, um, oh, that my substance was not hid from thee. Even then, that the, the substance, the matter of that, was known unto God. And, and I already had a plan for that. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect or uh, incomplete. And in the book... In thy book all thy members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. That is like, like God's blueprint in his book, in the plan that God has. And all of his members, all of his parts were already planned, already written, even from the time of very conception. That is an excellent passage on life beginning in the womb, although this is not a sermon on abortion today. Uh, it is still, nonetheless, an excellent passage. But what I want to focus on today is verse 14, which precedes that, says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This literally means that God took great care and reverence and attention from God when making us. That word fearful is the same word that we get that uh, is in um, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It says, um, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Later on in Proverbs it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that fear that we have of God is that reverence, that awe, that, 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 that incredible, that we revere God. And we are fearfully made by God in that same fashion. God has that reverence when he has when forming us and wonderfully or miraculously made. And even the description that he gave there about while the parts were not even formed, yet, but yet they were still written ahead in your book. And the miracle of life, just as you're watching how a little a, a little lump with a tiny little heartbeat that you can see on an ultrasound, and it's just transparent, but you can see that little heart there. And then as the next you know, the next uh, months proceed and you see the limbs form, and then the lungs form, and the, and the brain form, and, and you know, the baby can't breathe, but it's in the womb and swimming in water, doesn't even need breath, but as soon as, as, soon as they're born they need to breathe immediately and it's just wonderful how we are made god took great time and attention and care when making us can i suggest to you today that every one of us are uniquely made yeah Amen. we're uniquely made and there's no two of us that are the same. Even if someone has an identical twin. I mean, sometimes on identical twins, they have mirror twins. Where sometimes they're actually like a mirror image of each other when they look at each other. Where one might have a mouth that kind of hmm, kicks up like that a little bit. And the other one would have the mouth kick up on the other side. And so when they sit and look at each other, it's like looking in a mirror. But there, you take them apart and put them this way, and they're different. Even though they are identical, we they are different. All of us are different. Samantha, my wife, and I, very different. And most of the time, when we get married, we learn very quickly that we have differences one with another. My wife and I, we have an incredible love story. I mean, we met, we fell in love, or at least I fell in love that night. I don't know when she fell in love. Three days later, I asked her to marry me. Three months later, we were married. And, you know, and, and uh, I don't necessarily recommend that people get married that quickly however i do believe it was god's will for us that we got married that quickly sometimes god has a well god always has a plan but sometimes god has a plan for a quick marriage like that sometimes it might be a very long plan in the making we have some friends their their daughter joanna um fell in love with her husband or he fell in love with her i should say uh, i heard the story of when he asked her out on their first date uh he wanted to go on a first date to mcdonald's when he was six and she was four and they were like boyfriend and girlfriend through all of school before she was even in school and then you know they they broke up and got back together maybe once or twice but she graduates from high school and then they got married and so a very long courtship in the process sometimes it's that way but for some of us when we get married and we get moving in together my son matthew and his wife uh, they had a very quick whirlwind romance it seemed like they met saw each other a couple of times and next thing you know they're married and you know they they have to learn all of that stuff you know when they get together and they're moving together and, and they start to live together one with another we start to see hey that's that's different than the way I am that's not the same way that I am you know the, the, the same way that I do things there are many 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 books written on this subject many of which I have you can see there in the video watching online this is this is our library and we have quite a few books and uh, uh, there are quite a few books on families on romance relationships child rearing kids uh, one of the books that I think is my favorite is the five languages of love by dr. Gary Chapman that was the one that was the the main source of material that we used in our series on um, on the five love languages that we did when we started our family month. There are some other good books that are really uh, are really good for uh, the different ways that men and women are. There is one titled His, His Needs, Her Needs, which kind of takes a look at the basic needs of a husband versus the basic needs of a wife, basic needs of a man versus basic needs of a woman. And then there was a very famous book. It was in the newsstands, number one for years and years and years. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I'm sure just about all of you have seen that. And just talking about that men and women are different. It talks about, you know, there's, uh, plus some, let me go on, the, that old song, you've heard this song, You Say Tomato, I Say 
tomato. You say potato, I say potato, which is just another way of saying that we see the same things, but we look at it in a different way. We're different. We see things differently. Now, when we were courting, these differences were fascinating. When we were courting, we would see those differences and say, Wow, that's, that's different than I do, and that, that's, that's really different, and that's cool. When we were dating, those differences were intriguing. We were captivated by the differences and you know, the, the things that she was different than me. And that was, it, that was new and that was exciting. And, and, and I hadn't been with anyone who quite saw things that way before. And it was new and different. When we were dating, we found those differences to be very attractive to us. We, we, there, hey, there goes a baby. We say how, that, that phrase we hear, opposites attract. Well, people who are opposite one from another, you, your differences kind of are attractive to to that other person that you were with, and it can and they can, and they can turn you on. Differences have a way, though, over time, of maddening our marriages. Something happened after we were done courting; we got married, and over time, things changed a little bit. And after years and years of marriages, those differences turned from intriguing and fascinating to frustrating. And those, those differences turned from fascinating to, you've got a lot of idiosyncrasies about you, don't you? And those differences turned from an attractive thing to an irritating thing. My wife just said annoying. Thank you, wife. Differences have a way of maddening our marriages and causing us to lose track of what God would want for us to have in a marriage relationship. The Word of God is full of passages and scriptures that talk about the differences between husbands and wives, men and women, in a marriage relationship, and talk about how we are made differently. Men and women are made differently. Husbands and wives are made differently. And those differences are a reality. Once that courtship period is over and done and, and your marriage has begun and you've been married for several years, those differences can play a very important part in, in, in your marriage relationship and the way you relate to, it, to one another. Now this t sermon that I'm doing today is not a sermon on how you can change your mate. So if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking he's going to share with us some principles on how to change some things about him, about her or about him, that's not going to happen. This is not a sermon on how to change your mate. This is not a sermon on how you can change you. Aren't you happy about that? But it is a sermon on perspective. Maybe a sermon on changing your perspective or seeing your mate from a new or a different perspective that you perhaps did not take a look at them before. Uh, my question for you is this. Do you think it might be possible to change our perspective or how we think about someone else? Do you think that's possible? I think that's possible. There's a bunch of books out, various titles, various names. Uh, they're, they're wonderful in devotions. We even have some of them, but all of them have a couple of words in them. Those words are chicken soup. And we have several. I think we have chicken soup for the mother's soul and chicken soup for the Christian soul. I think we have one just called Chicken Soup. Uh, the Chicken Soup series has been out for over 20 years. There's probably 20 plus books in that series by now. But there was one of the illustrations in one of their books. I think it was the first one, Chicken Soup. Uh, just uh, relate the illustration to you today, a, a lesson on perspective. So there is a, a, a church... Um, you know, the church secretary, the phone rings, the church secretary picks the phone up and she says, hello, this is such and such church, can I help you? And there's a man on the other end of the phone who says, yeah, I'm looking for the head hog of the trough. In a very long, drawn out southern drawl, which I can't replicate, a very thick Texan accent, and the woman listening pauses for a minute and then she says, Excuse me, sir, are you talking about our senior pastor? 
And he says, well, if that's what you want to call him, you can call him whatever you want. I call him the head hog of the trough. She pauses for a minute, deeply irritated. And then she says, I'm sorry, sir. He's not available right now. Can I take a message for you? And he says, yeah, I'm just up here visiting from down south. And, and last week I stopped out to hear, stopped out at the Head Hogs Church and I heard him preach. And I was really excited about something that he said. And it was, it was a blessing to me. And I, I also saw that you all folks are having a fundraiser. And uh, I've got some extra money I'd like to give. And I just wanted to talk to the head hog because I'd like to donate a million dollars to your church for your fundraiser. She paused for another moment. And then she said, um, wait, wait a minute, sir, if you hold on a second, I think I hear that big old pig coming down the hall right now. You see, her perspective changed when she saw value in that guy. Now that she sees some worth, he's going to be giving us some money. Her perspective changed on what she thought of him a little bit. See, we, can, we have a tendency to change our thoughts on people when we start to see some worth in them, some value in them. And what I'm hoping here today is that by the end of our time together, that we might be able to look at our perspective on our mate Perhaps, simply, perhaps be able to change our perspective on our mate because we see some value or we see some worth in them. Perhaps some values even in the differences that our mate has with us. And to see value in our mate's uniqueness, how they are different from us. It can bring balance into our lives, our mate's uniqueness. One of the reasons... We go into partnerships when a couple, uh, two people decide to get into a partnership and start a business together. One of the reasons that we go into partnerships is because we balance each other out. Maybe this person is really good with um, putting estimates together and really good on the books. Maybe this person over here can't do an estimate at all, but he's a really good people person. And, and he can talk people and can take that estimate and really sell that estimate to the customer to get them to buy from your company. And so one of the reasons we go into partnerships is because we're different. And each of the people in that partnership have something that they can bring to the table. Something unique that they have to offer that the other person might not be able to have. And I, I, I want to Talk to us about some of the ways that our, our differences, that the things that make us different, can actually be a blessing to be able to come together and help us in our marriage relationship. I want to challenge you to do a couple of things for me today as you're listening to this. The first one is I'm going to challenge you to take some notes. I say this often. I tell people, you want to get some notes? This would be a good time to take some notes. I don't know if you folks out there listening online might be taking notes, but I would like to challenge you to do that. And maybe just uh, jot some of these things down. But more importantly, I would like to challenge you to come out of this sermon today with a commitment I would like you to make a commitment with yourself that right now in your minds, I want to challenge you to make a commitment that you are going to find a way to appreciate and praise your mate today. I want to, you to make a commitment with yourself that you are going to find a way that you are going to appreciate your mate for who they are and praise your mate for who they are today. And I want you to make a commitment and be determined today that I am going to go into this with the right perspective or I am going to verbalize that to my husband or wife. That I am going to go into this, that, that this isn't just something that's just for fun. That I am going to go with this with the right perspective, the perspective that I can change my perspective on my mate and that I am going to be able to verbalize to my mate the qualities that they have in there you know, that are different from me and that I can do that today. Can I tell you today that praise is a wonderful thing? Praise is a wonderful thing. Praise for me is like 
uh, like a bottle of ice cold Pepsi on a hot, muggy, sticky day. Maybe I've been out working. Maybe I'm exhausted. Maybe I was out playing sports or something and I'm just sweaty and I'm tired and I come in and, and someone has a cooler and I open up that cooler and there's a bottle of ice cold Pepsi in there and I take that off and just drink that back and it is just so refreshing. I mean, it's like a little slice of heaven. I'm convinced that's what they serve up in heaven is Pepsi, by the way. You know, uh, you know, stuff like water, that's nasty. They don't have much water up. It. But but uh, Pepsi, that's, I wonder if the river of life is made of Pepsi by chance. But anyway, all right, uh, that's, what, that's what praise is like for me. When someone praises you, it just absolutely makes your day. I mean, when someone praises you, it is like a shot of adrenaline. You are like, you are excited. You are ready to go. If someone praises you at work, it makes you want to be a harder worker. If someone praises you for the job that you do, it makes you want to do that job for them. If someone praises you and you know, at work and like you are such a hard worker, you do you do things that no one else can even begin to do. You want to go above and beyond for that company because you feel that they appreciate you, that they value who you are, that your existence is significant, that you have significance, that you are worth something to them. Praise brings out the best in us, but the opposite of praise is criticism. Criticism is the opposite of praise. Criticism is like drilling a hole in our emotions and letting all of our emotions drain out. When someone criticizes me, it wipes me out. I hate to be criticized. When someone criticizes me, it wipes me out. And it wipes other people out, too. I'd like to give you an illustration of a family reunion uh, we had several years ago. My nephew, John Paul, was recently married, and he is an artist. Um, he's not a famous artist by any means. He just does some art stuff, and he had his sketchbook, and he was showing people there. He had had a drawing that he made of his, his wife. They were just recently married. And they had one of those, if you ever, you, know, you take your photographs and get your wedding photos, and one of the ones they do is they'll put... You know, your hand here and your spouse's hand on top of you and you can each show off your wedding rings yeah and you get to see your wedding rings and get a nice picture of your hands together and we're unified we're together well he had drawn a picture of that with like him and his wife their hands together there was another gentleman there turned out i had never seen him before turned out he was a very long lost distant relative that none of us even knew existed um, he just happened to be coming up through the area traveling through happened to run into someone in the family and they started talking and just off the fly it turned out like his great great grandfather was also this person our family's great great grandfather and they started sharing some things and found out that this person was actually a member of the family so they invited him to the family reunion well he was an artist he was a professional artist i don't know if he how i've never heard of his name i don't uh, i don't know how famous of an artist he is maybe out where he is but he's a professional artist he has his own studio he does art for a living and so john paul is showing his drawing and, and he says this he comes up he's like um uh would you like a critique on your work and as soon as i heard that i just sank because i know what's coming next Critique is when you tell other people what everything that you think bad about what they're doing or who they are. I hate critiques. So, of course, John Paul, he's being nice. He's like, sure, I'd love a critique. So he sat down and he started to pick apart his drawing and tell how he needed to shade it differently here and how this finger looked out of proportion and this hand was wrong and the wrist wasn't done right, doesn't quite right. But even, all, all, even though he had done all of that, it was still a pretty good drawing. And with practice, he could be, uh, become a better artist. And I just looked at John Paul's face and, I mean, just it just sunk. And all of the joy that he had a moment ago when everyone was like, wow, that's terrific. And all of the praise that he had gotten, it just sucked everything out of him. I, I literally wanted to just take that guy and just punch him square across the jaw. How dare you come into our family and start telling other people and, and criticizing their stuff? People don't like criticism. I'm an artist as well. I do have an art studio here in my home. I don't do a whole lot with it. I, I, I draw, and most of you know by now, if you've been listening to any of my sermons, that I am disabled in my right hand. I heard it at work a couple, a couple years back, and um, 
Yeah, it was. It's my drawing hand. I'm right-handed. Uh, I have nerve pain in it, and I can still draw, but it hurts, and so I don't do a whole lot anymore. Um, pretty much, I don't do anything free on my own like I used to. If someone commissions me to do a work, I, I suck up that pain, and and I I can do that drawing or or that artwork for them. But the last one that I did on my own was a picture that's now hanging in our dining room of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, and I I did it. It was a uh, it was originally intended to be a gift for her for her 93rd birthday till I found out that uh, that uh, over there at Buckingham Palace that they don't allow you to send gifts, so they don't receive them. And so now it's hanging in our dining room. Well, uh, I did that drawing of, of Queen Elizabeth, and, and I, I do probably think it's one of the best, if not the best, one that I've ever done. My son David is also an artist. He has, a, he has his degree in fine arts from Corning Community College. He is now studying animation. He wants to be a Disney animator. So David's up here, and he's looking at it, and he says, oh, would you like me to give you a critique and my answer back was no mm -hmm. and he just kind of sat there looking dumbfounded like but well, why wouldn't you want a critique I, and I'm thinking don't you dare come into my house and criticize my artwork who do you think you are you know and and, and so we didn't speak for a couple of minutes and, and a, a couple of minutes later he's like well at, at college they teach us that we have to critique other people's work and I'm like well in the real world we don't you don't come up and tell people, would you like me to tell you what I think about your artwork? No, I don't want to know what you think. You sit and spin, buddy. This is my artwork. If you're not going to tell me how great it looks, keep your mouth shut. I don't want to hear it. My father always taught me that. My father always said, I heard it so many times growing up, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything anything at all. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Another thing he taught me was, if you can't do something better than that person, then keep your mouth shut. So many people get around at a ball game, and you'll sit there in the bleachers or home on TV, and the guy misses the ball, and you'll, ah, oh, you bum! How could you not hit that ball? Goodness, I could hit it with my eyes closed. Well, no, you couldn't. There's a reason why he's a professional ball player, and you're sitting here on your couch doing nothing, all right? Because you can't play ball as good as him. You certainly could not hit it with your eyes closed. So just shut up. All right? No one cares if you're at the ball game. Hey, hit that ball. What, you stick you out there. Could you do better? No. Everyone would be laughing at you. All right, just shut up. If you can't say anything nice about someone, don't say anything at all. I mean, just... It, it's, Stuff that is not necessary is criticism. Criticism is the opposite of praise. Just some more quick things on praise before I get into the differences uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, praise tells me that my significance is important. I briefly mentioned that already. Praise tells me that my significance is important. Praise number two secures us in our relationships. Praise denotes approval, doesn't it? When Kids, when I praise you, doesn't that make you feel pretty good? Yeah, amen, she says. And, and if I criticize you, that wasn't clean well enough, you can do a better job, that doesn't make you feel too good, does it? No, it doesn't. Praise secures us in our relationships. When I am praised, I feel that you approve of me because of who me and because of who I am, and I feel that because you have praised me. When my wife tells me that she likes the sermon that I've done today, that feels that makes me feel like she approves of me. That makes me feel that she approves of my preaching. That makes me feel like she approves of me pastoring this church. When, when I get that praise, then I think that I, I actually might have done a good job for once. Or uh, I could praise my kids, or I could praise Samantha. Now, having said that, out of this message, I want you to make a commitment that you are going to find some way to praise the one that you love today. Find someone to praise the one that you love today. For singles, if you're not in a relationship, I want you to take this message and I want you to find someone who you know could need, who needs a little bit of encouragement, and I want you to find something to praise them about and help give them a little bit of encouragement. All of us can use some encouragement. All of us can use some praise. 
All of us could use that, and some of us need that desperately. Here's some ways that we can praise. Oh, but before I get into that, here, one other thing. I thought I had it in my notes, but uh, maybe I looked over it. Maybe it's coming up later because sometimes they all kind of get garbled in my mind. Another way that you, I won't say it's actually criticism, is um, the lack of praise. My wife is a really good singer. My wife can sing very well. Um, when my wife sings, I like to make it a habit of going up and telling my wife, wow, that was, that was a really great song. You sing really well. The, uh, something that's not really criticism, but it is, uh, it's not praise at the same time, and that is the lack of praise. It might not be drastically right out criticizing them, but the lack of praise or anything at all. If my wife were to were to sing a song, a special song for us here in church, and then I said nothing to her. Or even worse, if she were to say, Wow, I was I was a little bit nervous um, singing in church today, and I say something like, Yeah, I know I could tell. That's not really criticism. But that's definitely not praise. That's the opposite of praise. We need to find some ways that we can praise our mate today. I'm going to go through some things, some differences that we have, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, just relationships that we have. And even though who are single or even you kids listening, there are some things you can find with your parents or parents with you kids. There are In our relationships and people that we have relationships with, there are differences that we have, and we can praise those differences. Number one, let's praise our personality differences. Let's praise our personality differences. If you've ever studied any type of human behavior or psychology, you will find that there are four basic personality types. I've heard them illustrated many different ways. Sometimes they're illustrated with pluses and minuses. I've heard them illustrated with animals. Um, one of the ones that I, I learned or know of most, there was a, a lady by the name of Florence Litterar who wrote a book called Personality Plus. In her book, she lists out the four different personality types other than names choleric, melancholy, sanguine, and phlegmatic. Choleric, uh, melancholy, sanguine, and phlegmatic. I'll just explain to you briefly what these are. All of us has a personality type. Um, we will have one dominant personality type that we are most of, and maybe bits and pieces of some other personality types. But just, uh, just really, brief, uh, really briefly, briefly, if I can talk right today, choleric. The choleric personality is that decisive personality, that, that, uh, that personality that a lot of people who are choleric have a tendency to become leaders in some sort of position, maybe in their company, maybe in the military, maybe in the government. They are decisive, they are driven, they are aggressive. Uh, those types of people can be argumentative. Many times it's their way and you know, any, way, any other way except for their way is the highway. All right, theirs is the right way to do it, and there's no other way. There's no negotiating. This is it. Boom, this is it. This is the way it needs to be. That decisive personality. The second one is the melancholy personality. The melancholy personality is that carefully detailed or methodical personality where everything has to be planned out neatly and correctly and right, and everything has to be a certain plan in a certain way. Uh, someone who has a melancholy personality puts a lot of time and attention and thought into something. A decision is never made spontaneously. The consequences of the actions are thought out well in advance, and they're very detailed and methodical in their thinking. And then you have the phlegmatic personality. The phlegmatic personality is someone who's just kind of, whatever, happy-go-lucky, I don't care, you know, it's uh, it, it, just, it, it doesn't matter to me, it just whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, sometimes the person who is the phlegmatic in a, in a relationship, they're more of a peacekeeper. They kind of go along with everybody. You can take the leadership. That's fine. You want to do it your way? I don't care. That's fine. You know, just, just uh, easy go lucky. And then the last one is the sanguine personality. That is that spontaneous, charismatic personality that likes to be the center of attention. Always, uh, you know, just, hey, I'm 
here. Look at me. And just every person, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so. Nice to meet you. And, oh, you go to school where? I know someone who went to school with a friend of theirs who went to school someplace like that. You know, where did you go to school again? Just all kind, just, just out there. Just, yeah, you're always going out and wanting attention and, and, and loving the limelight. And if you match these personalities up certain ways, they can be pretty hard on a relationship. Some of them, they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. For example, if you take that choleric personality who everything has to be like, let's do it, this is the plan, let's stick to the plan, and then they're paired up with a phlegmatic personality, so, I don't care what the plan is. You know, yeah, the choleric when church starts at this time, we need to be here at this time. Like, man, it's like, pff, people come in late all the time anyway. Does it really matter? Like, yes, it matters. It's important. Pff, it's not important to me. All right. So, so when you have those kind of personalities, that can be a little hard on a relationship. You know, and and the, the choleric, a lot of times, they're, the choleric personality is like, they, you know, you know and the house needs to be presentable. It has to be this way. It needs to be right all the time. Perfect. And the flag man, it's like, you know what? But lots of people have messy houses, and I'm sure other people, when they come over, their house is probably messier than ours. So what's it matter? You know, and that can be hard in a relationship. If you have someone who is a melancholy personality, who is that methodical, planned out, and you stick them with the sanguine, who is very spontaneous, you know, um, that can be hard in a relationship. Where, whereas this person, everything is all precise and 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 planned and detailed and the spontaneous person might not even know how to spell detailed and you know they're like well before we do this we need to do this and this and this and the spontaneous was like yay she's already gone you know someone there's a dam and there's a bunch of water i can down below shall i jump off of it while the malachi is still thinking about the rocks that might be down underneath the water the sanguine already jumped all right because they don't think about things in advance they're just spontaneous they're quick and these these personalities they can be hard sometimes sometimes they work together the choleric personality if he marries someone who's melancholy and this person's decisive and this person's detailed that works together pretty well and if the choleric person marries someone who is sanguine and this person's decisive this is what we're going to do let's do it and this person's spontaneous all right let's do it that works together but when the they they on the opposite side, the the person who's decisive marries the person who doesn't care. You might have a problem, and and, and so there's different different problems that we can. Amen. Yeah, the different ways that we can look at it. They say opposites attract. I already kind of mentioned that. The reality is that we often tend to marry someone who has a different personality than we do. And, uh, and I, I would encourage you, you, they have a website, Personality Plus is the name of that. Go onto that website, check it out. There's a little, you can even take, you know, a, a free profile. You can kind of go through and there's a bunch of questions it asks you. Answer them truthfully. Don't answer them the way that you wish you were. Answer them the way that you are. I mean, there's no good or, plus, good or you know, bad score. It will just help you determine what kind of a personality that you are. And I would, I've done that with my older kids. We did that. I found out that at least three of my older kids all have a choleric personality. And I have a cleric personality. And so you get a bunch, especially the boys, who are all sitting here, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. Ah. All right. There's battles and fights, and then you have rebellion. And then, I'm like, stop rebelling. I'm right. No, you're wrong. I'm right. And, and it just goes on and on. So even though you have the same personality, you have different levels. And they don't always get along. Maybe if everyone is phlegmatic and like everyone's sitting around and nobody cares. All right. I don't care. I don't care either what do you want to do today nothing all right i don't care you know and nothing ever gets done i don't know how they hold a job done because nobody ever cares to go to work you know nobody cares sorry you, obviously you can tell that i have some issues with a phlegmatic personality but but we we're different and, and we get together and we different and and you know good go ahead and take that test find out what your differences are even if we don't agree we can learn what our mate's personality is and by learning what their personality is it can help us better understand where they are and why they 
do the things that they do and where they come where they're coming from all right it, it helps us to be able to understand and then at the same time as we can understand why they are the way they are let us praise the good about them the way that they are the thing we need to do today is make a decision. The fact that our, might, that our mate might have a different personality isn't necessarily a bad thing, or it isn't a bad thing. We need to praise our mate for their personality differences. Oh, talking about my wife and I, oh, we have some great differences. I am decisive. My wife is not decisive. Um, my wife loves to go shopping at Tractor Trailer. For those of you who don't know, that's Tractor Supply Company. They have chains all across. My wife, for years, cannot figure out how to say Tractor Supply. It is Tractor Trailer. And so she just, oh, she's, what's that, wife? You just don't care. <laughs> so we were out shopping at Tractor Trailer the other day. And... We come out of the store, and, and our car is sitting like right there in front, and my wife says something kind of like this, Ooh, car! <laughs> and and I, just, I just turn over her, and I go, What? <laughs> and she's laughing, and, and what she had meant to say was, Where is our car? Oh, there it is, I see it, and somehow it came out. Because sometimes, being as spontaneous she is, she hasn't even thought about the words in her head yet, but they're already coming out of her mouth. And so she just, they're just, bleh. <laughs> and, hey, man. <laughs> just, even Julia is like this. <laughs> My wife just, she, she's very spontaneous. I want to challenge you all. That for all of the personality differences that we may have with our mate, there are reasons why God has put them in our lives to be our mate. And our personality differences, are, and they can be strengths and they can complement each other. You need to praise your mate for the strengths. And it is your responsibility to figure out what your wife or what your husband's personality is, learn their strengths, what those strengths are, and praise them for them. We're going to be praising strengths today. Now, we're not looking for ways, by doing all of this and studying personalities, we're not looking for ways to tear each other apart. That is not the point of this, and if you do that, you are taking this in the completely wrong direction. We are looking for strengths, finding a way to praise the strengths of our mate. Some of you may even have predominantly the same personality, but maybe in different degrees, different levels, and we need to be able to find the differences and praise them. I mentioned with my kids, like, I am predominantly choleric personality. My second personality is the melancholy, which is more detailed, more oriented, more you know, yeah. methodical and calculated. Have to be church at 10. Okay, we'll all right. Just stop talking in church. <laughs> right. This isn't that kind of church. All right. So, and then the last of my bit was more. Uh, I had some of the sanguine. So I, I do have sometimes that I am spontaneous and I do do things like you know that are just off the wall. My wife almost pure sanguine. I mean, just she had you know like ninety percent sanguine. She she was you know textbook sanguine right there. And her her others was phlegmatic. She didn't really care about certain things. And she had a little bit of choleric, but no melancholy at all. My daughter Kendallin, she was uh, an even even split between choleric and melancholy. And then she had some on the phlegmatic side, so that kind of rounded her out. So her personality is, we would say, predominantly melancholy. Kendallin and I can get along very well. We're both detailed. We're both we're, we're both um, methodical. We're both decisive. Ken and I can get along very well. Out of all of the kids, she probably has the closest personality to mine. Ken and her mom don't get along at all. Not at all. Mom's spontaneous. Ken is no spontaneous. Think it out. What are you doing? I mean, and the arguments that come up. I mean, it's just, just ridiculous, the stuff that comes out of them. Whereas, uh, Mom, why didn't you think about that? She's like, what? Think? You know, it's just, you know, it's just, 
And, 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 and they're different. We're different. But we need to praise our differences. We, ha- we have to be able to look at the differences in our mate and, and praise the differences today. The second thing we need to praise our mate for is our personal history differences. We're going to praise our personal history differences. What are those, preacher? Well, all of us have grown up in different environments. All of us have grown up in different ways, and the environment in which we grow up and the way that our parents are, that has an effect on who we are. It does. You know, um, people grow up many times to be, boys grow up to be like their dad, girls often grow up to be like their mom, at least in some way, shape, or another. We need to be able to praise our personal history differences. All of us have a different past. All of us have a different history growing up. Hey, all of us are different. Wouldn't you say we're different? Amen. Yeah, we're different. And all of us have a unique history. My wife and I had a very different history in how we were raised, how we grew up. I was raised in a Christian home. My wife was not raised in a Christian home. And how you're raised, you know, it has an effect on that. Birth order has an effect on that. The number of kids that are in your family growing up. A lot of times people who are an only child are a little bit more selfish than someone who is not an only child because they didn't have to share anything with anyone growing up. They got all of the attention and when they grow up, they still kind of think that it needs to be that way. No offense to you if you are an only child. I apologize. You know, I don't mean anything disrespectful, but sometimes sometimes it's that way. Sometimes if you have two children, a lot of times what's typical is that uh, the older child will take on a strong leadership role And then the younger child will take on a very competitive role because he's always thinking that older child has it better than me and he is competing with that. Then you start adding more kids and you start realizing that sometimes the middle children have that kind of um, attitude like, I don't care. Or, or, Or they feel like they are left out because the older child, they have more privileges because they're older and they might have a later bedtime or they might be able to do more things that they can do and the younger child might think well they're the baby they get spoiled and I don't get that attention anymore and so the middle children have a tendency to kind of feel left out sometimes amen Scarlett says that because she's not the youngest anymore all right Uh, sometimes middle children have a way of being good negotiators you see that the family dynamics in a family with like three people where you have the the older child might be arguing with the younger child with that competitive nature with the younger one versus the older one and the one in the middle is just trying to keep the peace and trying to keep the calm but our birth order differences have a way of affecting who our personality is um What your mom and dad were like has an effect on your personality. And how in the type of home that you were raised in. Some of you grew up in a home where you were abused. Some of you grew up in a home where you had to be tough just to even exist. Some of you grew up in a home where you were rejected. Some of you grew up in a home where you were loved very deeply. Some of you grew up in a home where the Lord's name wasn't even mentioned. Some of you grew up in a home that was deeply religious. Some of you grew up in a home that was a very conservative home. Some of you grew up in a home that was a very liberal home. Some of you were raised in a highly educated atmosphere. Some of you were raised in an atmosphere where education wasn't really that important. Uh, some, Some of you were raised in a home where a good work ethic was highly important. Some of you were raised in a home where everyone was lazy. And and all of us have been raised in a different way in our personal history. Now the question is, how can these differences help you? How does your spouse's past enrich your relationship? There is a movie, I will give you the illustration. I don't like the movie. It's a good movie, but I don't like it because it strikes really close to home to me. That movie is called Yours, Mine, and Ours. 
And uh, just out of all of the movies, that seemed to be just a look at my family. All right, so here we had the dad who was the military man. He was, uh, that dad was in the, in the Coast Guard. I was in the Navy. That's pretty darn close. Uh, Dennis Quaid and Rene Russo, if you're wondering. Good movie. Go watch it. I mean, they, they, they met. They were old people, knew each other from high school. They met years and years later. Um, and, you know, they just whirlwind marriage, um, you know, got married that day. And, and they had kids from their different relationships. And, and their kids were different. The military man, all of his kids were respectful. They, were, they would sit at, stand at attention if he called upon them to do so. I mean, just, you know, um, very, you know, they, they obeyed the rules. They did everything that they were supposed to do. The mom, she was like, oh, we. And just and she was a hippie and she could care less and her kids went everywhere you know and, and, and I, I saw these dynamics in my wife and me here I here I am I'm trying to raise the kids to be military brats my wife she if, if she can raise them to be little kitty cats and little dogs and they crawl around on the floor in a, in a, in a restaurant and that's okay you know and that, that's fine I remember we were at, at, a, at a pizza hut one time and uh, the, Jeannie David and Matthew they're all sitting in their chair um, just eating politely doing what they're supposed to do Caitlin and Kendallin crawling around on the floor meowing and barking and everyone in the restaurant is sitting there looking at us like something's wrong and they're, they're just they're making a scene and my wife is like oh they're a kitty and a doggy you know, and, and I'm not that way. Uh, I'm, at, I'm at Walmart and the kids are misbehaving in the checkout line. I'm that's it. Attention. And they all stand in attention and get in the height line. And from tallest to shortest. And people just stand around me like, what? <gasps> you know, I don't know if, they're, if they, they think I'm abusive because my kids actually hop to when I say that. Or, or they, they wish that their kids did that because they have no control over their kids. But I sit there. It's not calm. It's peaceful. They don't say a word. They just stand at their attention. And I, I run through the line, check out, turn around, start walking away. The kids stay there. They don't move get a little whiz away and I turn around and say alright fall in and then the kids all jump right up behind me and then they all walk behind me single file right out the store I mean different if you ever seen that movie they had the, the concept of a talking stick well guess what we had that too oh that movie I hate that movie oh that's just it just strikes so close to home I see that talking stick I'm like you gotta be kidding me the whole movie was just making fun of our lives alright they didn't even know us and they must have like secretly watched us and planned it or something it's just you know we had the talking stick pass the talking stick around to get your turn it just it's just it, you know but it, you, you see in that movie where their differences actually drove them apart they they uh, toward the end of the movie they were heading for divorce but then the kids all rallied together and they started focusing on the strengths that they had between them and they ended up saving their marriage and, and then having their family all together as one big family. And, and in the end, it, it, you know, honestly, it was a good movie. You can watch it. It's okay. Preacher doesn't say, don't go watch this movie. Yours, mine, and ours. It's a pretty good movie. Yeah, just too close to home here. But, but uh, you know, those differences can unite and bring us together like that movie my wife and i have had a lot of differences and a lot of differences in the way we do things and because we had a very quick courtship and a very quick marriage we were thrown into those differences very quickly but i want to say that i have been enriched because of the differences that my wife has for me i have learned to loosen up a little and have a little bit more fun than I used to because of my wife. See that, honey? I'm giving you praise. <laughs> my wife, who had no disciplinary skills at all, has learned how to discipline a little bit better. <laughs> because of, of the way that she's... Uh, because of the differences that each of us who brought into the relationship. And, and our differences in the way that we were raised and the way that we grew up, they affect us, but there are strengths that we can find. And that can enrich us in our relationships. Number three, we need to praise our extrovert and introvert differences. We need to praise our extrovert and introvert differences. Just a few thoughts. Extroverts like to be with people. Introverts like to be alone. 
I am an introvert. I don't need a lot of people in my life. My wife is an extrovert. She always wants people around. We leave church. We go, uh, go to, you know, if, if we're in a, like, uh, go to uh, visit another church or something, we get ready to leave. Okay, I'm done. Church is over. I go out and sit in the car. My wife stands around and talks to everybody who walks by. All right, we're just, we're different that way. If I wanted, you know, my, my wife, and as I just said, I'm an introvert. My wife is an extrovert. If I wanted to go out to eat after church and I said something like that to my wife, I say, hey, honey, would you like to go out to eat after church today? Her response would be back something like, sure, who can we get to go with us? Because right, she would rather be around people. And here I'm thinking, I, I want to get away from everybody and just be with our family. And, and she's thinking, why on earth would you want to get away and be by yourself when there's so many people that we could invite to go with us? All right. She just she likes doing stuff like that. If I get out of work a little bit early, I might call my wife and say, hey, honey, would you like to do something tonight? And she'd say, sure, that sounds like a good idea. Who do you think we could call to come with us and go do something? Right. And I'm thinking... No, I just wanted to do something together with you alone. That's truth. <laughs> That's truth? <laughs> this, see, <laughs> extroverts and introverts are different, and there's, there's so many different ways that we are different because of the way that we are. An extrovert will tell almost anyone everything. Introverts, that's what mom is. <laughs> Introverts don't like to tell anybody anything. And that's you. Unless, yeah, unless they feel it's necessary. They're different in that, the way they are, aren't they? Mom and I are different, aren't we? Yeah, they're different. Extroverts and introverts are different. Extroverts plan out loud. They seldom do it. Or might not even mean to do it, but they still plan out loud. They say what they're thinking. Introverts think that if someone is going to say something out loud, it means that they're going to do it. And if you're not going to do it, then why say it? So my wife likes to look at houses and magazines. You know, ever you know, ever since back when we were searching for this house that we got here, uh, we were looking at houses and magazines. And my wife likes to look for for houses and magazines, and and, and she'll just sit there and say, "Oh, look at this beautiful plantation home. Wouldn't it be nice to live here?" And I'm thinking, "Great." Why did we waste time buying this house? We should have just kept looking for a plantation home. And now I'm sitting here in my mind thinking, goodness, can we afford the mortgage on this house? And we just moved in here, and now we got to go and move again. And Oh, I'm not looking forward to this. And, you know, I, uh, is our credit score even good enough to be able to get a loan? Does the job that I make, is it even enough to have the money to make the mortgage payments? And all of this stuff is going through my mind. When my wife might not have any desire to move at all, she's just, oh, look, house. You know, and, and, and that's about it. See, extroverts... Think out loud. Introverts do not. And we're different in that way. Hey, didn't God make us different? Yeah. God made us different. We need to praise one another in our differences. And now I'm going to get to the meat of the message. Number four, we need to praise each other for our gender differences. We need to praise each other for our gender differences. And you can't pick and choose your gender. There's not 112 different genders, and there's no gender neutral. There is male and female, man and woman. Male and female created he them, Genesis chapter 5, verse 2. God made us different. He made us uniquely different, male and female. What I'm about to share with you are differences that we have simply because we are the opposite sex, because we are men and women. You could say, Pastor, is this that you're about to share with me? Is this 100% correct? No. No, it is not. It is... You haven't, I haven't even gotten there yet. Why are you saying amen? All right. I, it is not 100% correct because some men don't act like most men. And some women don't act like 
most women. So, 80% correct. I'd like to share with you some differences between men and women. The first one I want to share with you is that men communicate in facts, women communicate in feelings. Men like to share facts, women like to share feelings. I think you'll find that this is true a lot of the time. Men think with facts. Women think with feelings. It may be something like this. I'm at work. My wife sends me a text message. And it says, When you get home, we need to talk. <laughs> and I get this message. And I'm thinking in my mind, Great, something's wrong. I've done something wrong she's mad at me about something or I'm thinking there's something very precise that we need to talk about so I get home and and Samantha says okay we need to talk and I say okay what is it and then she says something like this how do you like your job and I'm thinking, wait, did she get something in the mail? Did I get fired? You know, does, you know, is, does she know something that I don't know? And then I say something like, I like my job fine, like what's wrong? Or perhaps I think nothing of it and I think this is the end of the conversation. Just like, hey, I like my job fine. Conversation done. And then she says something like this. D'Artagnan's birthday is coming up in October. He'll be 10 years old. And at this point, I might say something like, good. And then she goes on to say, honey. And I might say something at this point like, is, is there more in this conversation? I mean, is there more or are we done? And then she'll say something like this, honey, do you love me? And... I'm thinking, wait a minute, um, how do I like my job? D'Artagnan's turning 10 years old. Do I love you? Like, where is this coming from? And, and, and the problem is because I am looking for the facts. She is looking for the feelings. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that is true. You know, I'm looking for the facts. She's looking for the feelings. She doesn't care about my job. Well, I, I mean, she cares that I get paid, you know, and that we have money that I bring home so that we can eat and stuff. Uh, but, you know, if, if I had another job, she'd probably be fine with that. And, and, and she doesn't care that D'Artagnan's got a birthday. Well, maybe she cares. She cares that D'Artagnan, she cares about D'Artagnan. And, you know, she, you know she, he might care that his birthday is coming up and he's 10 years old. And, you know, he's one step closer to getting married, right? And, you know, he's, he nods his head. All right. But, uh. You know, he might care about that, but for her, 9, 10, 11, 8, they're, you know, they're, they're just, they're, you know, you know I, I care about my son, but the age isn't that big of a deal. And, but what she's trying to do is, you know, she's trying to have some conversation. The confusion is that men express themselves in facts, women express themselves in feelings. Now, men, let me say this to you and those listening out there online. We are richer because of our wives. Can you even imagine how boring society would be if it was nothing but men? I mean, what do you want to do? Nothing. All right. How was work today? Good. Okay. Just... It'd be, all, it'd be kind of like we're all a bunch of robots. We'd just walk around and, what do you want to do today? Nothing. All right. We're just all just mindless, you know, you know, don't think anything about it. Women bring feeling into our lives. That's one of the differences that God has made us different. And I want to say to you that we become better communicators because of our spouses. Thank the Lord for emotion-based women. That emotion brings life into men that practically are non-existent when it comes to what life is without that mate in their life. That's one of our differences. Men and women, men think with facts, women think with feelings. Moving on to number two. Men tend to be independent, women tend to be interdependent. What do you mean by that? 
Well, think about your boys and girls growing up. I remember um, David when he was when he was younger, and he would sit. David would go over to the pen jar, and he would get out all kinds of pens, all different colors and shapes and stuff. And he would sit down on the couch, and he'd have all around well what he would do is he, he didn't need like action figures and stuff although he did have those and he enjoyed playing with those but he would pretend that each one of those pens was you know like a superhero or a soldier or whatever game he was playing each one of those pens was a different person every one of those pens was a different person and he could keep track of which pen was which and then when he would sit and have him fight he'd, he'd stick and put them in his fingers and just kind of twirl the fingers so the pen would spin back and forth and he would just make them hit each other and it, David would sit for hours sometimes days on the couch playing with his little, little pen soldiers you know, he didn't need anyone else to play with him he was perfectly fine Matthew, I would watch Matthew put Legos together in his room by himself for what seemed like days on end, just sitting up there putting Legos together. Our girls, not like that at all. Girls want someone to play with them. See, boys, now, now, now the boys did play with each other, and they had friends, and they'd get, in, you know, all kinds of do stuff with each other, but they didn't have to have that. If they didn't have anyone to play with, they could play by themselves. They could do it. And the girls, nope, they need to have someone to play with. Scarlet, D'Artagnan will be sitting here playing with some little action figures, little superheroes he's got going on. Along comes Scarlet with her little princesses. And Scarlet now needs to make the little princesses marry the little action figures, and then they all have to have families together. And D'Artagnan's like, I'm just trying to have a war. She's trying to make them all get married and have babies. You know, and, and you know, Scarlet needs someone to play with her so she can have a family and play out. D'Artagnan, he's good playing the war by himself. See, Scarlet has a little kitchen set out in the kitchen scarlet will go out and she will make food but you need to come with her because she is going to take your order and she is going to cook the food while you watch don't leave you need to be there watching her and then she will serve you the food and as soon as you are done she will make you more you will be here forever <laughs> Because she can play for a long time. And you better not have anything else that you want to do. Maybe you're lucky enough another kid might come by and you can have her serve him some food. And then you can get a break. But, you know, the, the, the girls are like that. Then they become teenagers. The boys, you know, they had friends. They did stuff with friends. They didn't need friends. I mean, you know, boy, they could still get along and do things on their own. <laughs> the girls, it was not that way. Girls got to have a friend. In fact, I can remember quite a few days with our older girls who are grown and gone now, and, and they would come home from school, or they'd be out with their friends, and they'd come home. And the, the door would fly open. They're crying. They go running upstairs to, to the bedroom, and I go up, and, honey, is everything okay? Everything's fine. Ah! You want to talk? No. Which means yes, by the way, but sometimes they have to talk with dad, sometimes mom. It just depends on the situation. And trying to figure it out is a nightmare all of itself. But, you know, it's just the, 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 the going through those, those tender teenage years with the girls, you know, and friendships were just, friendships were everything to them. And they were so hard to keep and to hold on to just right. And it was so hard for them. The boys... They didn't need a friend. They, they, were, they get along just fine. But that's, that's the difference. Men tend to be independent. Women interdependent. And when we get to be adults, it kind of stays the same way. You ever notice when you go out to eat that all the ladies get up at the same time to go to the bathroom? They do. The men don't do that. If two men get up to go to the bathroom at the same time, you think they're weird. But the women, i got to go to the bathroom. I'll go with you. Why is that? Because men are independent. Women are interdependent. That's the way we are. That's just the way. That's one of the ways that God has uniquely made us different. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> that is true. Now, there may be some differences here. You know, maybe, maybe this doesn't relate just typically to the way that you are there may be some differences but you know the, the point that i'm trying to make is we need to understand that there are differences between us and our mate because of our genders and we need to praise one another for the differences not get angry because they don't see it the same way that we do 
The third thing I want to say is that men connect by doing things, women connect by talking. Men connect by doing things, women connect by talking. My wife and I are both disabled. My wife has uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which is basically a chronic nerve pain condition. She has it all throughout her body. Some days she's in a wheelchair because of it. Weather changes hurt it. A lot of things affect it. It's, you know, it's, it's really tough and it's really hard on her. I actually have the same thing just in my right hand. It doesn't go throughout all of my body. Um, I, I, you know, um, she's, she's got a little bit worse than me. But uh, when we were younger, things were not that way. Both of us were very physically active. My wife and I were both into bodybuilding. I was a bodybuilder. You just certainly couldn't look, tell it by looking at me now. But when I was a younger man, I had a little bit of mass to me. I was a bodybuilder. I was also a martial artist. I, I ran a martial arts school for several years. I was into extreme sports and free climbing and... and and I make great cookies. Well, okay. But, uh, but I was into all those physical activities. My wife was also into those physical activities. She didn't do all the same things that, that I did. But she was also into bodybuilding. Just uh, We had very different styles as to how we would bodybuild. Uh, for example, I would uh, back when I was single, I'd be working out at the gym. I'm working on the, the butterfly machine. And uh, a pretty girl who was working out at the gym would come over and start hitting on me. And I'd yell at her. Like, what are you doing? I'm working out here. I don't have time for this. You're messing up my pump. And uh, she, you know, she, she'd go away and wouldn't bother me anymore. I'm like, goodness, interrupting a guy while he's working out. You know, I didn't come here to flirt and pick up dates. I came here to get big. All right. I have a goal. I have a plan. I'm decisive. This is the plan. Lift the weights, get big, get strong. My wife, on the other hand, she'd go to the gym. Now, she did work out because she had a nice body, but I don't know how she found time with it, time to do it because she was too busy socializing with everybody in the gym you know she just you know the, the gym is a social place and there's lots of cute guys you know, she, you know there's cute guys you can meet at the gym all they obviously they're they're big and they're cute and stuff and you know let's let's go flirt with them see we have different ways of of looking at that you know see because my wife is a social butterfly i am not you know we're different back then Let's just say years ago, if you know, just to use this, this illustration of back when we were healthy years ago, my wife and I, you know, she's more into it for the social thing. I'm more into it for the activity. So my wife would say, "Hey, honey, how would you feel about going walking or running tonight?" And I'm here running, and I'm thinking, "Okay, cool. That that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that." Now I've got my plan, decisive. This is my plan. I'm, we're going to go over to the high school track, and I'm going to get out my stopwatch, and I'm going to hit go, and we're both going to go and I'm going to take off running and you're going to take off running or walking and uh, the other, we're, you know, we're going to finish up and then I'll meet you back at the house. All right. You know, um, it's, it's kind of one of those things here. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm here for a plan. I'm so how can I get my mile fast enough? I need to get my legs bigger, stronger. You know, there's a plan. I'm going to go, go running around there. And if I come running around and I happen to pass her, it's just going to be like, Hey, you know, and I keep right on going by. And then after I finish, however many laps I'm doing, I'll hit the stopwatch, got the time. Okay. And then our plan, we'll get back to the house and we'll talk about how it went quickly. Not her idea at all. She had wanted nothing to do with the run. My wife's plan was she was looking for the walk. And thinking that the entire time that we're walking, we're going to be walking together. And, and, and as we're walking, we'll be talking together. And if I'm going to run, it's just going to be kind of like in small circles around her while she's walking so that I don't break up the conversation. Because it wasn't the activity that was important for her. It was that we were together talking that conversation, not to break up the conversation. 
my idea was that we would connect by doing things. Her idea was that we would connect by talking. I could give you another instance. My wife might have said to me, hey, um, what do you think about working in the yard today? Let's have an afternoon and let's spend the day working in the yard. And I say, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I've got my list of things to do in the yard and you've got your list of things to do in the yard. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to get my stuff done and you're going to get your stuff done and we will get working in the yard. Her idea has nothing to do with what I think is the right way to do. Her idea is that we are going to go and weed the flower bed together. And when finished weeding the flower bed, we're going to go off and do something else together. And as we're weeding the flower bed, if we get the flower bed done, fine. But if we want to just stop and talk. That's okay. We're just working in the yard together. And I'm thinking, we're not working. I mean, we're just sitting here. I could have that flower bed weeded in five minutes. Look at all this stuff that we have to get done. See, we speak different languages. Men <laughs> Men relate to each other by doing things. I'm working, you're working, we're together. All right. Probably true. This is probably true. Women, uh, women connect by talking. Do you know why? It's because we're different. It's because we like playing. It's because we're different. Men connect by doing things. You know, I, I, I can give you an illustration. This is years ago. There was some talking in, but not quality conversation like the kind of talking that my wife is thinking about. I remember the first time I went to see the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, with my friend Preston Davis. We were doing a, a job out of town, working in this little place called Delhi, New York. Uh, doing um, uh, roofing work. It was in the middle of winter. Snowstorm came up out of nowhere. You know, we couldn't do the job anymore, so we shut the job down. And we we're like looking at the time, like Cooperstown's not too far away. You ever been there? Nope. No, let's go. So we went to Cooperstown. All right. So we're seeing the Baseball Hall of Fame. Okay. So now you got some things that I like. Baseball, which especially back then I loved. I lived and breathed baseball back then. And two, history. I love history. So baseball history is naturally going to be something that I enjoy. And and so I, and Preston was that way too. So we're going around and, and we're in the Cooperstown Hall of Fame. We're like, look at that ball. Go, Ooh, that belonged to that guy. Look, those are Babe Ruth's shoes. They've been brown. Check this out. Look, at this locker was Mickey Mantle. That locker was Hank Aaron. Look at this throw of bleachers from Ebbets Field. M many of you don't even know these people that I'm saying. Ebbets Field was the, was the baseball stadium in Brooklyn, New York, which is long since down. We're sitting, we're sitting down in these old bleachers and and we we're like, should I do it? Yeah, let's do it. So I grabbed the seat next to me in this like hundred year old baseball bleachers in the middle of inside the, the Hall of Fame. And I start banging the seat like you do in the ballpark when you're trying to drum up the people. And so he's doing it. And the two of us are banging the bleachers. And all oh, I mean, it was, you know, honestly, out of all of my life, that is one of the single most days that I enjoyed the most. I, I said, look at this. Look at that. Ooh, check that out. Look at that. You know, and, and we did converse. The bulk of the conversation is, oh, look at that. And both of us would say it. We didn't talk about anything else other than what we were looking at. But we're connecting by doing things together. Women connect by talking. Men can sit and watch a movie together and not say a word the entire time. And if you come and say something to him, he's going to say, Shh, don't talk during the movie. All right, we're, we're, yeah, yeah, we're watching a movie. See, just that they don't have to be t connect and talking, but they're watching the movie, and boy, are they connected. I mean, they're just together watching that movie. You, it'd be like, you know, a couple guys can go out and play basketball, do some one-on-one, -on -one, and they're shooting hoops back and forth, and the entire bulk of the conversation is when they're done, one of them says to the other, good game. And the first and, thing they do is playing with Okay, so, sorry. So uh, that's the bulk of the conversation. And you're, you're back home, and you're talking with your wife. And it's like, man, I, I really like that guy. And she's like, well, why do you like him? He's like, ah, we connect, man. We just, we just connect. Well, what'd you talk about? Talk? Talk? We're, we're, playing, we're playing basketball. We talk. See, men connect by doing things. Women connect by talking. 
And we need to understand the difference and we need to praise the difference. The fourth thing is that men tend to compete, women tend to cooperate. Now this isn't just a blanket thing because I will admit that some of the most competitive people that I have met in my life were women. My ex-sister-in-law, Sue, I say that because um, she it didn't really, not a divorce, but um, she was my brother Dan's widow. My brother Dan, he passed away, and, and Sue was his widow. She has since then remarried, and uh, is now Sue Murphy, rather than a Sue Spencer. But, you know, just, you know, she always was just close with the family, and she's always still considered to be family. So I remember years ago, back before I met my wife, we had a little Spencer family get-together. It wasn't a full family reunion. It was just us and our immediate family. So it was myself and the girl that I was dating at the time was with me. I had my brother Mark and his wife Gail, my brother Steve and his wife Chris, my sister Becky and her wife, her, her wife, and my sister Becky and her husband Paul, and then my, my brother Dan's widow Sue. And we were all up there and we, we had like a little picnic and then we decided to play some volleyball. Well, I'm a competitive guy and I used to be pretty good at volleyball. Well, Sue is a competitive woman. And she is pretty good at volleyball. So we found that our, our family get-together very quickly became a competitive match to see which of us was better at playing volleyball. And, and you know, it wasn't a friendly match anymore. I'm like, I'm diving in front of my brothers to get the ball, and we're sitting there trying to see who can spike the ball the hardest. Ooh, that hurt. The hardest in each other's face, like I just spiked my pulpit here. You know, we're trying to spike the ball the hardest. You know, just, and, and, we were, and we were like that, and we were competitive. I can't remember who won that game. I, I, I think it was me. I hope it was me. But uh, I I, you know, I can't remember who won that game. I remember on a different occasion, we were at a family reunion. There was a lake, and my Uncle Irwin had a boat, and he would take people out um, water skiing. And I can water ski. So I'm out, and I'm water skiing, and I'm, I'm not the best at water skiing, but I'm not too shabby. I can stay up for a while, and I can't do a lot of tricks and stuff, but I can stay up, and I can have fun. So I'm out water skiing. Sure enough, not too long after I'm done, Sue gets up, and she starts water skiing, except... She is a little bit better water skier than me. I'll admit it. You know, she starts doing some tricks and like uh, skiing barefoot and skiing one-legged and uh, you know, just um, you know, turning around while being on the skis and uh, you know, like doing flips when going over the wake of the boat, different directions and stuff. You know, and just showing off a little bit. You know, just just you know, probably not just because I did it, just to show me up. But it might very well have been because she is competitive. And there are some women who are very competitive. My my wife is a very competitive person. My wife is a very competitive person. I already mentioned how um, back when you know we were talking about when she used to bodybuild and you know she had been offered to be in various competitions and stuff, um, but you know because of how competitive she was and the and the competitive nature that she had. But for the most part, men tend to compete and women tend to cooperate. My wife sometimes can't understand why I don't let my kids win at games. My wife can't understand why I don't let them win, and I, I can't stand them winning. I mean, yeah, I, I, she, she's like, come on, just let them win. And I'm like, no, that, that, that's not the right idea. That's, that's not how we play this game. She's like, but they need to understand how, the importance of women. Like, yeah, but they also need to learn how to lose, and I'm going to teach it to them. I mean, I didn't, I didn't come here to play the game to lose. I came here to play the game to win. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't let my boys win. I don't let my girls win. I didn't play the game to lose. That's not what I do. But my wife can't always understand that. Why is that? Because women tend to cooperate. Men tend to be competitive. I remember deciding a long time ago that I was going to raise tough boys, not sissies. And one of the ways I decided that I was going to raise tough boys was when they got into fights, I was just going to let them fight it out. All right, so uh, they, you know, David and Matthew, they would get in fights. I just, all right, just, you know, slug it out, you know, you know, one of them would 
win sooner or later. You know, you're, usually the fight doesn't last too long. Um, but uh, we'd also do a lot of play fighting. And I, you know, I mentioned martial arts. I'd do you know some martial arts play fighting, and the kids would play fighting. Well, as they would get older, they started getting a little bit more aggressive. And so I remember play fighting with one day, and I can't remember which one it was. It was David or Matthew. But one of them, they just got me in a little bit of a chokehold and it's hurting a little bit, and they're holding on a little tighter than they used to. And you know, and, you know so and, and you know. I, you know, I, I got out of that chokehold, and if I remember the story correctly, I maybe like turned around and did like a little back side kick into their gut and kind of sent them across the room a little bit. And they're like, oh, okay, okay dad, all right, Dad, that's enough. You mean, <laughs> they started to realize Dad's getting a little physical here, but, you know, they started getting a little physical first. So what, what is that? What is that nature? Competitiveness. Competitive. Men are competitive. And that's the way that God made us to be. Matthew recently got out of boot camp. Well, I didn't say recently, about a year ago now. Uh, he got out of boot camp, and we went to see him graduate. And while we're down there, I don't know how this happened, but we started an arm wrestling competition at a restaurant while we were waiting for dinner. And it was kind of like whoever, we were both arguing over who was going to pay for the food, him or me. And I guess we, whoever won the tournament was going to pay for the food. So we started wrestling. And I, I honestly believe that Matthew was going to beat me because he's just fresh out of boot camp. He's been exercising. And you know, I'm old and I don't have everything with me now, but I, I will be happy to say that he has not beat me yet. I, I did win and I had to pay for dinner because of it, because I won. But, you know, why are, why, why are we doing that in the middle of a restaurant? Because men are competitive. Because that's, that's the way that we are. It's the way that God made us to be. My parents, I remember my parents being out driving. My mom would be out driving a car. Car tries to get in front of her, she just let him in. Yep, you can get in, no problem. My dad, you're not getting in front of me. I was here first. My dad's driving 55 miles an hour, car passes him at 60, dad passes the car again at 65. You just see, he keep right on going up, and, just, and my mom's like, "What are you doing? You're speeding." He's like, "He got in front of me." She's like, "It doesn't matter if he got in front of me." He's like, "I need to be first in line." You know, they're driving down through the city. This car needs to get in. My dad's, he's not getting in front of me. Dad pull right up, chrome to chrome, bumper to bumper with the person next to him. Mom's like, "What are you doing? Let them in." Dad's like, "He's not getting in front of me." Why is that? Because men are competitive. Women are cooperative. Now, it's just not all the time, but in general, women are cooperative, men are competitive. Hey, we're different, aren't we? Huh? We're different. Men and women are different. We need to praise each other for our differences. And we need to turn our differences into something that we can praise each other for. God made us different, didn't He? God made us different. Some of you are sitting here saying, well... You've given a bunch of illustrations, Brother Spencer, but that's not me. I really don't relate to one of your illustrations. That's not really the type of man or woman I am. Well, that's your problem. I don't. I don't know what to say about that. I mean, this. You know, I. I think that this is right, and that's why I'm sitting here preaching it for you. See, God made us different. Men and women are different. I think we have differences. Maybe you don't think we have differences, but you know. But but it's good. God made us different, and it's good. When men are competitive, women are cooperative, it's good because it is the women who pull that competitive nature together. I remember at times arguing with my kids, my older kids, like they're they're getting ready, Dad, it needs to be this way. I'm like, no, it's not going to be this way. And we're like, that rebellion and stuff is going. It's mom who is there in the background. Come on, calm down. Stop doing this. Let's stop the fighting. I would get in an argument with one of our more competitive girls, and I would be sitting there, and I'm yelling, and she is yelling, and here comes mom in to try to smooth things down. It doesn't have to be this way. Why is that? Because men are competitive. Women are cooperative. She's trying to pull us together. God made us different. And I'm going to wrap it up here. Here's what I want to say to you today. We need to understand our differences and we need to let our mate, mate's differences help bring us together.
not tear us apart. We need to understand the differences. We've talked about a lot of differences between husbands and wives, between extroverts and introverts, between family histories and backgrounds, and, and, and just the way that we're raised and our personality differences, and all those differences. We're different. People are different. We need to praise those differences and let this bring us together. And, and, and we've had some fun today. We've fooled, around, we've fooled around a bit. We've had some laughter. But there is a point. And that point is that we are all very different. And that God has made us different. And that He has brought us together, husbands and wives, men and women, because those differences are His plan for us to be able to be together. My wife, the day I met her, I was already starting to fall in love with her that night. I've mentioned it here from this pulpit before. I was sitting in the car that night. We had said our goodbyes. I, I had met her. We'd spent the day together. I was saying goodnight to her. I was in the car, and I remember saying out loud to myself, you know, as I was falling in love, I'm like, what are you doing, stupid? Yo, what are you thinking? And I, and I heard God speak to me. His audible voice said, this is where I want you to be. God brought me and my wife together. By the way, speaking of marriages and husbands and wives, just because we were engaged in three days and then married three months later does not mean that that's God's will for your relationship and your life. God brought us together. That night, I knew. It only took me three days to propose because I was so, so worried that I, you know, I didn't want to get my heart broken. But God brought us together. God brought us together knowing that we were different. God brought us together knowing that she's an extrovert and an introvert. God brought us together knowing that I came from a Christian home and she did not. God brought us together knowing that she is a woman and I am a man. And that's the way it needs to be. All right, No other way. One man, one woman. That's God's plan. God brought us together uh, and even though we have different personalities. We're different. We're different. And God brought us together. We need to see those differences and figure out how those differences can enrich our lives together. God made us different. We're very different. We need to praise each other for the differences. And I want to ask you, when was the last time that you have praised your mate for the differences that they have with you? My challenge to you today is this. I would like you to sit down, get out a piece of paper and a pen, and I would like to write down how you and your mate are different. Write down your differences. And then I want you to take a look at everything that you wrote. Write down your differences. Husband, wife, man, woman, extrovert, introvert, all those things. Write down your differences. And after you have done that, take a look at them. And I want you to look and see how that difference has enriched your life. How your mate's differences have bettered your life. Not ways that has turned it down. See, the very first thing when you sit down, what's going to happen, I guarantee you, the first thing that's going to come to mind is you're going to start thinking about all of the negatives that they do that you don't like. Everything negative that you would like to change about them. But that's not the purpose of this. We're not looking to criticize. We're looking to understand and we're looking to praise. See, your mate is who she is or who he is, and that's who they are. Certain things can change. I mean, if you're a drunk and, a, and an adulterer and a whoremonger and you, you know, curse and swear and, and all that stuff and you're not a church-going person, God can work a miracle in your life. He can clean up your attitude. He can clean up your language. He can clean you up and make you so that you're living a pure lifestyle morally, sexually, and stuff like that. God can clean that up. But your personality and the things that have made you who you are, your things in life, your history, historical differences that is who you are that is who your mate is and that's not going to change and you're not going to change them but you can look for the positives in their life in their relationship with you look for the positives and when you can do that you can find ways to praise them and find ways to appreciate them and find ways to love your mate even more Samantha, 
if she wanted to today, could sit down and write out a long list of negatives about me. I couldn't do that about her. She, she could about me. Well, no one even thought that was funny at all. Okay, well, it's not, not completely true. But uh, in reality is that we need to write a list. I need to sit down and write a list as about my wife, about Samantha, how she is different than me. I need to stay with it and see how our differences have immeasurably helped us in our family. And you need to do that also. You need to sit down and talk about the differences, think about the differences that your mate has with you and how that has helped you, helped your marriage and helped your family and it will help you make the best out of the marriage that God has given you because God has a plan for your marriage and your marriage ending in divorce is not that plan. Maybe you'll even realize that your mate's differences have helped keep your marriage together. Some of you whose marriage have been on the rocks. Even though some of those things that your mate does that absolutely drive you crazy. Even though your mate has some things that they do that you know, might drive other people crazy. Or that you have things that you do that drive other people crazy. But because of the things that your mate does, it kind of keeps you in check. So you're not driving other people crazy. And you work together. God made us all uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully different. It was his idea to make your mate that way. It was his idea to make you that way. He gave them their personality. And he allowed them to have the history and the past that they have. God made them male and female. He made us who we are. Let's not fight it. Let's praise our differences. Let's not fight it. Would you make a decision to do that today? Would you make a decision today that you are not going to fight against who your mate is, but you are going to praise their differences? I brought this message today in our series on the family because for some of you, it is just a practical lesson that you need about how to have a marriage relationship. Relationship, I'm sorry. And you need to get your eyes off of the differences. There are a lot of marriages that drift apart. By the way, this this, this is a, is an astounding thing, Colin. I'm not ready yet. You can, all right. I'm um, Colin is uh, getting ready to shut the video camera off. Church isn't done yet, Colin. All right. Until we eat cookies. Statistically, says there are a lot of marriages that drift apart at about the 20 year mark. It just seems to be like a, a, a leading time for breakups. After couples have been married for about 20 years, marriages start to fend, uh, fall apart. It sounds crazy. But it, it just, it just, just right around that 20-year mark. I believe that one of the reasons that that could happen is because we have only looked at our differences critically. We have only criticized the differences that our mate has rather than looking at their differences as a positive thing. I want you today to look for a positive reason, a positive reason today to praise your mate, a way that you can praise your mate in order to bring out love, to bring out the love in your mate when all she has in mind for you is hate. And as strange as that sounds, when your relationship is such that you are on pins and needles all the time and fights are breaking out constantly, we need to look for a way... Please knock that off. Church is almost done. You can, you can calm down. We need to look for a way to praise the differences in our mate. Praise the differences in our mate. Praise those differences... God gave you that mate, and he's got a plan, and in God's plan, it is not destined for your marriage, your relationship to end in divorce. God wants us to be able to work together. He gave them differences different from you. You all have differences. He wants you to work together. The Bible is full of illustrations on how you can work together. God wants us to praise our mate. 
Now everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. We've had a lot of fun today. This wasn't a very practical message on salvation today, but uh, I just I would like to you know try to get something across to your hearts, and I'm just I'm going to go right into a prayer. Lord, God, we've had we've had some fun today, Father, and I pray that we haven't had too irreverent of a church service today, Lord. But I would just like to pray, Father, for for people listening to this service, dear God, that you will help them in their marriages and in their relationships. For people who are looking to be getting married, I pray that you would help them be able to take some lessons from us to be able to apply for when they find that mate that they're looking for, to be able to look back and realize I need to praise them for their uniqueness and how they were made, not how different they are than me. Dear God, I pray for marriages that are on the verge of ending in, 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 in a bitter bitter mess, crash and burn and divorce, Lord. I just pray, Father, that they might take a step back after listening to this and just try to take a look at the differences that they have with their spouse and write down those differences and be able to realize how that unique difference has enriched their life. That, that if they look at the negative, rather than seeing that as a negative, they can see that as a positive. That that difference can have something good for them and for their relationship. I pray for that, Lord. Dear God, I pray, Father, for even some people here today who would like salvation, who need to get saved, although we haven't preached a message on salvation. But, Lord, the very first step in, in being able to have any kind of relationship with God at all is, is that salvation experience. Lord, I pray that if anyone might want to get saved, Lord, that they would make the decision to do that today. Dear God, I pray, Lord, for... Um, for people who might even want to be thinking about joining this church. Dear Lord, they've heard a bunch of the sermons. They think, maybe I want to call this my church home, even though I'm watching it online, that this might be the place that I would like to settle down and have my family and be under this type of preaching. Lord, I pray that if anyone who is thinking about that, that if it's your will, that they would make the decision to do that. I pray for decisions that need to be made today, Lord, and pray you will be with these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, everyone, continue head bowed and eyes closed. For some of you, perhaps you would say, Brother Scott, you know, I, the very first thing you talk about all this stuff you're reading from the Bible, the very first thing is, I'm not a Christian. I, I, you know, I'd like to have a relationship and understand that, how God wants to have a purpose and plan for my life, but I need to get saved first. I, I don't understand this, and I need to get saved. If that is you, I would like to encourage you. I'm going to have a prayer in a little bit. I'd like to encourage you to take advantage of that prayer and get that settled in your heart. If you are if you are convicted in your spirit that you need to get saved i pray that you will make that decision today for those of you who are here in church if you need to get saved today i pray that you would make the decision to get out come up to me i would like to sit down with you here at this altar and just sit here and tell you how you can know today that you can have the lord jesus christ as your savior Perhaps some of you here, or some of you listening online would say, you know, I, I got differences with my spouse, but I never really looked at it the way that you've described it, seeing those differences. And I'd like you to pray for me. I'd like to pray for you that God will help opening your mind. You know, when we were doing the, the series on the love languages, one of the things that it blessed, it was a blessing to my life was learning the different love languages that my family, my wife, my children have, and understanding that when they do a certain thing, that that's actually communicating love to me, although I might not receive it as that. And the same thing with this, that when my wife might do something to me that just seems a little out of the ordinary, that there's, there's a reason behind it. And if I can just begin to understand the reasons behind it, that maybe I can appreciate that a little bit more. And I, you know, if, if some of you are like that, you'd like me to pray for you, just, you know, even in here, raise your hand and say, Brother Scott, I just, I, I need some help. I need to be able to understand and be able to pray and be able to understand my mate better. Help me be able to understand the uniqueness that my mate has and be able to help me in that relationship with them. Maybe you listening out online, sorry, out there online would be that same way. And you would just like, you know, um, I, I, I want to understand this better. 
Perhaps some of you, as I said, would like to join this church. I, I hope that you will make that decision today. If you would like to join this church, I hope that you would go online to our website at, at uh, www.swordandtrailrevivalfellowship.com and just, just uh, go on to our website. And you can go through those pages, scroll through the different things that we have on there, and, and you know, consider thinking about joining our church. I just say it would be a blessing to have you as part of this ministry in here with us as we try to serve the Lord together. Uh, I just, as I close... If you would like to get saved today, I, you know, this, I, as I said, this wasn't a message on salvation. I don't know if it was a very strong message on conviction, but I would hate to have you leave here without the opportunity to having, uh, be able to get that saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. So if you would like to get saved, just pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I know that you came into this world and died on Calvary's cross to forgive me of my sins. I now ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and forgive me of these sins that I have committed. I am sorry that I have broken your laws. I am sorry that I have lived my life in a way that was contrary to the word of God. I am sorry that I have sinned. I'm sorry that I have transgressed. I'm sorry for my iniquity. Lord God, I now repent of my sins. It is my intention to serve you, and I'm not going to go back, and I don't want that life again. I want to have a life that is pleasing to thee. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And friend, if you prayed that, God can... God can come into you. If you prayed that and meant that with your heart, He will come into your heart and He will save you. But as I said many, many times, the prayer is just words. It's not head knowledge that He's looking for. It's heart knowledge. You get to that point in your heart and life when you are serious that you want to have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart as your Savior and he, you ask Him to come into it, your heart with a repentant and an obedient mind and attitude, He will do it. And if you asked that and meant that today, then He did that today. Friends, thank you for joining us at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. It was a blessing to have you here with us. I pray that God will be with you as you go on your way today. Thank you. Take care and God bless.